This episode is brought to you by a collaboration between the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. We're going on a road trip. at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science here in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I mean, this place has got mountains, it's got a splash pad, it's got this beautiful bear sculpture, and it's got this amazing museum that has been a fixture of Colorado and Denver for over 117 years. And I've heard that they've got some amazing research and collections work, so we're gonna go check it out. I'm also super out of breath because the altitude's really high here. I gotta go. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science has a lot of what you'd expect in the collections of a natural history museum. Zoology and anthropology, an awesome earth sciences collection with vertebrate and plant fossils, and minerals. On the public side, they've got a gem exhibition that mimics an underground mine, beautiful dioramas, an exhibition on space, and a stomping T-Rex. But the museum also has something pretty unique that I've never seen in a natural history museum, a health sciences collection with an exhibition about genetics where people are the scientific focus. But it makes sense. Humans are a huge part of the natural world, so it's understandable that we'd study ourselves in the same way we study other organisms and communities around the planet. Dr. Nicole Garneau is the museum's curator of health sciences. We stopped by to learn more about this unique collection and have a chance to participate in her research, because here's the fun part. I'm about to be the newest addition to their collection. So, Nicole, we are in a collection that is nothing like a collection that we have at the Field Museum. What, where are we? We're in the Health Sciences Collection in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Okay. So going along the theme with that humans are part of the tree of life, it's really important for us to study our own biology, not necessarily in a human health sense, so it's kind of a misnomer, it's called health, but just really understanding from body to system to organ to tissue to cell to DNA. What does it mean to be human? So <laughs> what, are, what are some of the things that you have in this collection? I'm really excited to see. All right, let's go. Myself. So we start off with um, an educational collection that includes things from full human bodies down to specimens like this, which allows to see systems working together. This, what? Correct. What? <laughs> you have an arm. We do. And um, it was the donor's intent, and so all of our specimens have donor intent with them. You want my arm? Can I give you my arms? You need to go through a proper donation process with okay. the state of Colorado, but all yes, right, absolutely. Right. Okay. <laughs> You can have my arms. So this is a really great way to teach people because it allows us to take something that feels sometimes abstract like a collection and make it feel very personally relevant and makes you really curious about, well, how does my body work? How is this prepared? I mean, I think this is another reason like why I've never seen anything like this in a right. museum. This is not a normal preparation technique. Anyone who works on a wet collection, for example, which is typically like gonna be soft tissue, and you put it in like formaldehyde or alcohol, there still is going to be aspects of decay mm -hmm. occurring, so the collection is not really kept forever. Plastination eliminates that because anywhere that there was water is now plastic. You have something that you can then be used for generations and generations and generations for educational purposes. It looks like a like a plastic model that somebody had to mold, but to know that it's this was- real, this was a real person. I kinda wanna like touch it. Go ahead and grab your glove. Okay. Probably just need one. Plastic is kind of pliable, so mm -hmm. if you feel it, Whoa. it's kind of hard, but it is kind of has that plastic feel to it. Ugh. And that's kind of what you want, because you want something that's not going to degrade over time. But this isn't the only thing that you have in this no, collection. No, so this is at the big side. Yeah. Um, and then let's dive deeper. Oh, nice. What is essentially <sighs> looking directly into the body, like you were doing an x-ray, except for again, that this is, this is real tissue. They kind of look like pizzas, I'm not gonna lie. This is a slice of a body. Yeah, so these are different These are different slices of, of the body. The preparation is that the bodies are frozen. Again, donor intent for educational purposes. 
and then slices happen and then those slices go into baggies and those baggies get a different type of plastic, an, an acrylic based plastic and dyes that bind to different tissues and you get something like this. This is one of my favorites, which is a transverse slice of the wow. human hand. Oh my gosh, it's like my hand. Right, That's so what the if, inside so of my hand looks like. if I put this on top, that would be, wow, this is a really good match for you. <laughs> <laughs> So how is this information being used? I mean, besides this being like a really cool, interesting collection, right. how can looking at this inform mm -hmm. some aspect of science? We use them for mostly for education. So okay. these type of specimens get incorporated into all of our programming about the human body. Everything from little guys, right, the wee ones that come through all the way through high school students. And then, like I said, we work very closely with communities that tend to fall into that health sciences area who are interested in anatomy, for them to have a more in-depth understanding and access to resources that can help them do their jobs better. Um, so medical students, uh, massage therapists, I mean, it runs the gamut, sports yeah. therapists. But then you have even smaller things. We do, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can start really big and then we're shrinking. At this level, we're now diving into tissues and cells. These are also slices, but on a really small scale, and these are slices of tissue. And this particular collection that we're working on right now with our students is the, is the intestines. The nice thing about this collection is it not only has normal normal histology, so just things are going good. Yeah. Basic science, right? But it also has pathology, which is what happens when things go wrong at the cellular level. So we're able to have a collection that we're going to understand, digitize, and make available for research purposes. Both the, here's normal, how human cells work, and here's what happens when things go awry. And then you have another collection that you're building that is even smaller than it the is. cellular level. It is! So we have thousands and thousands of these little tubes. So we're small but powerful. So this is pure DNA. So when people come to my lab, which I hear you're gonna do, and they do a cheek swab, we get their cheek cells, we get rid of everything in the cheek cells except for the DNA, and we save the DNA in a liquid solution so we can study the DNA. So you're actively allowing museum visitors and people coming to this collection to contribute their DNA to be a part of this greater understanding of human biology. This represents a person who came to our lab as a guest of the museum and who is now officially part of the museum's research collection. I, I want to, can, can I be a part of the museum? We collection? would love to have you be a part of it. Yeah. The goal of the Science of Sour study is truly the big goal is to figure out if we can find the gene or genes for sour taste. By doing this huge population study where people are tasting sour samples and we get their DNA, we can compare the taste data to the DNA data. The reason why we have this community-based aspect and the citizen science aspect of our work is because we want science to be accessible and personally relevant to people and concurrently have people feel pretty jazzed about learning how their own body works in genetics. I'm jazzed. Yeah. I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's do it. Okay, so we already did the informed consent. So you've yes. agreed to participate in this research, which is awesome. And we're going to start the taste test. Oh boy. So go ahead and grab your nose clips and you are going to wear them like a unicorn. Oh, okay. Yep. Like and then you do the sniff test. <laughs> that's perfect. If you can't breathe through your nose, okay. that's good. So go ahead and take those off okay. um, while I give you the rest of the instructions Ooh. so you don't have to wear them. When we want to study just taste, we have to try to remove all the rest of the cues. Okay. So we're removing smell. Um, we're removing mouthfeel because all of the all of the, the samples will, will feel the same in your mouth. They'll feel like water. Okay. Um, we're removing visual cues because they're just clear, so there's no colors. Okay. And sound isn't too much involved in this one, although sound can play a role. Like if you crunch a carrot and it, you think it's supposed to be crunchy and it's not crunchy. You have some nasty carrots. Correct. <laughs> so we use all of our five senses for flavor. We're just studying taste, so okay. that's why we use the nose clips. Gotcha. What you're going to do is um, put on the nose clips. You're going to take the solution marked L. Okay. Now take a deep breath and then put the whole thing in your mouth, swish it around for five seconds, spit it out, and then mark how intense the sour is. Okay, here we go. That was pretty weak. I've got to say that okay. was like a that was like a diluted lemonade. Okay. All right, like if you go to some kid stand and they're like, "What's a lemonade?" but they didn't make it right because they didn't get the ratios correct. But you still give them a dollar because it's a kid it's selling a kid. lemonade. But now that's... you're gonna say, "How much did you like that solution?" I slightly liked it because I like citrusy things, and it was kind of citrusy. So now you can take off your nose clips and take a deep breath in and out, and <sighs> cleanse your palate with some water. Okay. And we're gonna hit next. So we have other questions that we need to answer throughout, and this is okay. done purposefully to give your tongue a little bit of a break in between samples. What is my race? I am. Very white. Next. Am I a member of the museum? Not currently. We'll work on that. <laughs> so we're gonna go to sample E. Okay, with back with my... Yep, the reason why we have it like this again is so it's double blind. I don't know which of... So we're testing five different sour molecules to figure out if those sour molecules, if all sours created equal. Okay. So the reason why we have them randomized is so that you don't know which one is which, and I don't know, so I can't kind of prime you. Is this malic acid? 
I don't know. And then I don't even know what malic acid is. That was a little more sour. I'm gonna go with like like middle of the line. Sourness. All right, so go ahead and take a sip of water. All right, power through. Swallow without the nose clips on. Okay, nose clips. Have Sniff it. test. All good. Uh, uh, corn. Uh. All right, take a deep breath. That was tart. I don't know if it was like quite sour. That was like a sweet tart. Okay. And uh, I slightly liked that. I'm probably gonna slightly like all of these. That's good, that's fine. We're gonna ask you some questions about food adventurousness. And that's oh. how likely are you to try new foods? It might be a factor in how you may rate something. Okay. Is basically what taste scientists wanna know. Gotcha. Because humans are messy. I don't trust new foods. I disagree extremely with that. I like foods from different countries. I agree extremely. I'm very particular about foods that I will eat. I agree, no, what, no. I disagree slightly because I did travel to Denver and pack my own lunch, the same lunch that I eat every day in Chicago. <laughs> okay, that was a good answer then. All right, I'm ready. That was really, that was really tart. Kind of puckering <laughs> a little bit. My mouth is suddenly very dry. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't know if that's sour, but I'm gonna put that, that was a little bit more Bork strain, putting that a little bit over the middle line. Go ahead and get some water in there, and we are going to do the DNA sample. Whoa! We're going to collect cheek cells. So these cheek cells are right now hundreds, if not thousands of them, you just swallowed them. So instead of you swallowing them, we're just gonna take some of them. Okay. Um, of course, with your permission, yeah. and de-identified so that no one can use your DNA against you. So my name is not going to be attached no, to the sample. No, you are a visitor ID number. You're gonna pop this out, you're gonna pick a side, don't switch sides. Try not to touch your tongue or your teeth. And the reason why we want cells is because cells have DNA in it. Your DNA is like a cookbook for your body. So a cookbook has recipes, your DNA genome has recipes, they're called genes. And just like if you have a recipe for chocolate cake that you got from your mom, but maybe you changed it a little bit, that change in the recipe can totally change the way the chocolate cake turns out. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens in human genetics. These little tiny changes can mean that we have changes in ways we can see, like hair color and eye color, and ways we can't see, like how we experience taste and detect taste. Go ahead and now put that in there. Well done. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I did it. I did it. You did it. We'll go through and do an extraction process where we'll get rid of everything in the cell except for the DNA, and we'll end up with this tiny little tube of Emily's DNA, de-identified. And that becomes part of our human biology collection here at the museum. So by participating, you get to be part of our museum forever. Yay! Which is pretty sweet. It's always what I ever wanted. You get to be, yeah. So we're good to move on to the last taste test. Okay, all right, last did one. It. Not gonna lie, that was a, that was a little, little on the disappointing side. In terms of like flavor explosion. You really wanted things to yeah, escalate. I really, I was really <sighs> expecting, I was kind of hyped it. You were like, you might not like some of these things. And everyone's just, an individual. So we have people hype. who come in who are like, all of them taste super strong to them. Really? Which is really good for me as a geneticist to say, there's clearly different interactions going on here. Let's figure out if genetics is part of that. I'm gonna say I, I slightly liked that because I guess I'm just a fan of acidic mm -hmm. tastes. Mm -hmm. Can I take this off? You may. Okay, all right. Because you're a part of our study, um, we have a where do you fit board, and that board has a dot for if you love sour, take it or leave it, or hate sour. And so this is kind of nice because real quick, guests can come in and see that, holy cow, like eight to 12, love sour. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see the different, the different kind of data point snapshots. Cool. All right, and that's yours. Thanks. Thanks for participating. No, Thanks for coming. I'm part of science. You, you're part of science, and you're part of the museum's mm -hmm. permanent research collection. So has brains on it.